old friends. Um, so today's talk is based on a joint work with Matt. And everything I speak, you can ask him and he'll probably tell you better than I do. But it's also relying on pretty heavy machinery uh, that was developed by Tristan. <clears throat> Uh, Matt, uh, not there. <clears throat> uh, last year, so we we take from our monograph some of the pretty nasty and unpleasant, but very useful machinery that was developed here, and we basically uh, build on top of that. Okay, so before I state the theorem, initially, by the way, I wanted to talk about uh, shock formation, but uh, somehow after Steve's talk, there weren't many questions, so I thought that maybe this is the wrong audience to talk about shock formation. And then I decided to talk about this, and this morning when I woke up at five and started to prepare my talk, I was thinking, okay, let me just write the theorem down and just do the proof for 50 minutes and be over with it. But instead, I decided against that, and I'm going to start to by first telling you why you should ever care about this in the first place. Um, and most of you know everything I'm about to say and more. It's a story I like to tell because it's important to know why you're doing uh, what you're doing. So for me, all this on cellular program is motivated by hydrodynamic turbulence. And turbulence, you know. It's uh, something about fluids that you can measure in experiments, or you can actually simulate PDEs and measure solutions of those PDEs. Quite amazingly, they give you very much the same thing. So that would mean that the PDEs are actually relevant to turbulence. That you know, turbulence doesn't miss. Uh, sorry, the PDEs don't miss maybe some truly, truly fundamental macroscopic physics. And and so what this whole program is about to me is to construct examples in which you show that the PDEs do sustain solutions which have the same properties seen in turbulence. It's not the end goal, of course, it's a starting goal. So <clears throat> what do I mean by turbulence? I'm just gonna refer to so-called experimental facts. Three experimental facts, which I'm going to mention anomalous dissipation of energy, I'm going to mention the four fifths law, I'm going to mention intermittency. The first two bullets ask any physicist, there's no question what is meant by this. It only means one thing. The last one can mean many things. And I, by fact, I just mean nobody questions that this thing exists. So what is the first item? <clears throat> so when you write the energy balance law for oil, uh, for Navier stocks, right? Then you get a dt of the kinetic energy, and I mean the energy density, not integrated. Then you get a divergence term, and then you have a term which dissipates energy. And, and that thing is basically equal to and this d is the dissipation measure. And uh, delta Z is just the increment here. And phi is a modifier, uh, even of mass one. <clears throat> um, so this appears on the right hand side. Sorry, on the left hand side of the energy balance equation. So 
this is how much energy is dissipated point-wise. And this result is due to the schoner robert And this is the weak formulation of the so-called uh, karman horvath manin relation. And so, of course, in turbulence, you don't observe these things point-wise, you observe some averages. And by averages, I guess in experiments, you mean long time averages, you use the Taylor hypothesis, et cetera. And you may give this a name as epsilon nu. I'm going to use nu interchangeably with one over Reynolds number, which is very illegal, but I will make this, I will sin. And <clears throat> anomalous dissipation of energy refers to the fact that the limit as equals to zero epsilon nu is positive. And that's somehow the, uh, what Serini once called the zeroth law of turbulence. And this is an experimental fact. And the reason it's relevant for PDEs is because it shows you that solutions of 3D Navier stops. Which are seen in turbulence, so I should add the word turbulent ones, not laminar ones, cannot have, cannot remain uniformly bounded with respect to new. Um, in a certain space, which is L3 in time. BS three infinity. Uh, this norm of the solution has to blow up in order to have anomalous dissipation of energy. With large probability. Sorry. With large probability. On average, with large probability. Um, and so, in particular, in the limit when Reynolds number is infinity, you should care about weak solutions of Euler. Because in particular, they can't be smooth if they were to dissipate energy. So that's A. B uh, refers to the four fifths law. And so, so we have so called longitudinal structure functions, which is the mean of. So maybe let's call this L is that. Um, like this, and maybe this average means long time average, it's maybe average over the torus, and it's actually nice to average over the sphere. So z hat is a direction on the sphere, so this is a longitudinal structure function, and basically what people observe in turbulence at the inertial range high Reynolds numbers, um, it scales minus four fifths epsilon L, where epsilon is epsilon, L is the length scale. So this is meant to hold Reynolds numbers, which are huge and for inertial range. So L is much less than the input scale size of the box. And it's also much less than the dissipative scale. And P is three, or you're going to write P over P is three. three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's worth noting that this object um, twiddle means equality. <laughs> twiddle means uh, there's four five. You're taking some limits. Yes. So that's why I don't want to write equal, right? Because there, I don't want to write limit. Okay. Uh, so this is the longitudinal structure function. You of course also have absolute structure functions. And of course, both of them have units. P, U being a velocity unit. And given that <clears throat> epsilon L has units of U cubed, Basically, based on scaling, Kolmogorov predicted that the structure functions should scale again in the sense 
<coughs> in the inertial range for high Reynolds numbers on average, like um, epsilon L. But in this case, there's a CP or something. If you think you're using it, say, uh, yes. Thank you, Tristan. And there's actually a lot of debate about what this constant is when P is not three. Um, okay. So that's the four fifths law, and this is Kolmogorov's 1941 prediction, which leads us to point C, which is intermittency. It has been observed experimentally that this is not actually true when P is not equal to three. By true here, I just mean that there are many, many, many experiments of turbulent flows which do, do display a so-called anomaly for the Kolmogorov scaling. And so if you were to really write this properly, you would write it like this. So L is again the size of the box. Nothing, everything has the correct units. That's why you need to write this thing. And zeta p is the structure function exponent just the limit so you want to say not true when p is not equal to three right is that yeah. right? i'm sorry thank you tom <laughs> i refrain from saying that <laughs> uh, please do not refrain to interrupt me because uh, it's not my uh, yeah. So, how, what do people actually see? So, if we're plotting p, we're plotting zeta p, and draw two, three, four, and I'll draw a line which crosses through the point one. So, this would be the Kolmogorov line, slope one third. Um, experiments see that one, this, and stuff like, stuff like that. I don't know, on purpose a bit vague. And in fact, in fact, according to a paper, a recent paper by uh, Ayer Srinivasan, yeah. In there, is it 10,000 cubed? I think I read that it's 10,000 cubed, so this is from 2020. It's a huge simulation, it's an incredibly large Reynolds number. They are confident about this. And moreover, they make a pretty bold claim that finite What does it mean that they confident about that number? I mean, is it a specific setting that confident means that I think it's universal? No. Confident means that in their simulation. Okay, for their setting, they take an, an average, an okay. ensemble average. And so they, they have statistical bias and they look at the tails and they're confident that that number is, is still a well resolved simulation and the statistics reflects the actual. Statistics. They're confident in a particular setting. Ex exactly, exactly. We're not saying that this is a universal number. Absolutely right. It makes me It's really may say that, but. Let's not uh, let's not talk about this. Uh, I, I would say that this is the truly remarkable statement in this paper. They have a whole section dedicated to it. In particular, so basically they're saying that there's a cap here. Of course, you know, for statistical, <laughs> if you're looking at these scales when p is 10, they start to become a bit fat. So I think in their paper they say that they're confident for p is 12, what their number is. And they extrapolate, okay? You're not going to measure uh, the 40th moment. <clears throat> the 
reason I claim this is a bit um, surprising is that if you think about the structure. Wait a second, it's not surprising in the sense of physics because there were theories already that were predicting this, right? But there were also many theories which were predicting not this. Right, no, absolutely no, but surprising in the sense <laughs> of math, but not surprising in the sense of. They, they, they didn't, uh, I mean, if you think of the. The first time. It's not, yes, it's That's not the first time. It's not the first time. It's just the most up to date. Uh, yeah, Hoth uh, already had the theory for, for this long time ago, and it was really a shocker. Yes. It's absolutely right here. It's just that it's the latest simulation I'm aware of. And if you think about what regularity structure functions encode, see, I keep on making mistakes and nobody corrects me. Um, uh, regularity, so SPL scaling La Zeta P, epsilon L, I mean, this relation, I meant, you should. Read this if you're doing the analysis correctly, that the regularity of the field observed. What do I mean by regularity? You know, in turbulence, there's an inertial range. You know, there's no such thing as regularity, right? It's a slope. And of course, you crank the Reynolds number, you get the same slope. You crank the Reynolds number, you get the same slope. So you basically say, okay, I'm going to extend the Reynolds, the slope to infinity. And that's what I'm going to call regularity. And the regularity would be B zeta zeta P. P. And I guess I should remind uh, myself and the audience the not best of norm. Same increments that you see there. Same this LP norm corresponds to the piece moment. It's the same. So in particular, this claim means that in turbulent solutions at high Reynolds number, zeta p over p converges to zero. So in particular, it means that no held irregularity. Uniformly for this turbulent solution. The shoulder exponent of the limiting object is zero. Uh, at least zero. So that's the smallest shoulder exponent. Because when you take P to infinity, that corresponds to the smallest shoulder So the, what what's the largest one is not I mean it's not clear. So you have a you have you have a spectrum where you have a So zero is the smallest. Mm -hmm. Because when you take what you mean the transform, right? So you have to look at that at the slope, right? That's yes. the other exponent. So when p goes to infinity, that gives you the, that gives you the smallest other exponent. So that's zero. But Alexei, you're dividing by p. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Whatever number I'm gonna get here, unless it's infinity, you're gonna get zero. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, it is zero. So but it that's, is zero. That's the smallest exponent in your in the spectrum. Okay. Right, but it can be the whole. It so there be will be more. pieces of it which be more regular. Right, 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 right. right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. By the, by the way, well, if you actually look at the data, yep. I think there's some bias in saying it goes to zero. It looks, in fact, like it goes negative. Yeah, you told me this. Yeah, so which would correspond to moments diverging. So Theo. this P star, such that all LP with P bigger than P star also blow up. I'm not as uh, provocative. Okay. So this is what is seen in turbulence. So far, and by seen, I, I really mean either take Navier Stokes, simulate it on your computer, measure, or do as best as you can actual experiments and try to use some kind of lasers to measure velocity increments. So what if I can? Yes. Well, to understand for L infinity norm, what, what are you saying for L infinity norm? What the Phil's conjecture is saying? What I'm saying is that it probably remains bounded. So you're saying it blows up. So even L infinity norm 
if as nu goes to zero, you will see, okay. And I mean, Theo told, talk to me about this. It's not just his opinion, you know, okay. there, there are theories. Okay, so going back to math, so far just uh, quote unquote experiments or physics. So what is our goal? We're not gonna prove, or at least I'm not gonna prove in my life, in this lifetime, that any of this happens in Navier Stokes. And the reason that I'm not gonna prove that are these averages. Mm -hmm. To say that this happens, when you average against the ergodic measure, or I'm saying this a bit uh, softly because who knows what that means, is not something that I'll ever prove. So then your next goal may be, okay, you cannot prove this um, holds with some statistical significance. Maybe you can just give a single example. Give a single example. matches ourselves with A, B, or C. I'm also not going to be able to prove that probably. <coughs> uh, hopefully some more younger people in the audience uh, are going to do that. Instead, we're going to give examples, not one, but many. For Euler, it's like a single example of matches that still has to be a limit. So a single example means to give a sequence of solutions indexed yeah. by Reynolds number, yeah, which have these properties. Currently, there's no one. For me, this is the holy grail. If you want to talk about averages, you need to talk to Jake or Sam or other people. Examples can be built, however, for oil. This is the business that <coughs> Laszlo and Camilo started, and this is the business that this program is part of. It's to build, exa build examples for um, Euler, which display features that are seen in turbulence. Okay, so what does that mean if you build them? It means that, keep in mind that we keep on making this supposition that as the Reynolds number goes to infinity, we extend the range, um, the inertial range goes indefinite. And so we're dealing with Euler. So what these constructions show that there is no, to me, what they show, one of the things they show is that there's no contradiction between the PDEs that we use to model fluids and turbulence. They're consistent in a way. And hopefully we can build more and more examples which resemble more and more properties of physics. So this brings us to uh, the main result. And then, I'll, I'll, of course, I'll put the result in context uh, immediately after. This result did not provide a vacuum. So the result says that for any passes less than one over three, there exist infinitely many um, non-conservative Work a bit harder, you can make them the city. Meet solutions of 3D order. Which belong to the space of continuous functions in time and the best of space BS 3 infinity. 
And this can be done for any S less than one over three, but in fact, it's more solutions. <coughs> have a monofractal intermittency dimension which the language means according to the beta model which we all know is wrong but it's a place to start that the solutions belong in fact h uh, sorry continuous functions in time a bit less than h1 half and a bit less than infinity by less, I mean the same less that S is less than. In fact, that result follows merely by interpolation. And of course, any space in the we in is interpolated uh, just like that. Um, so this is the main result of Matt, um, which I also helped him write. Um, and it basically fits into the context of results established in relation to the Unsager theorem. And the Unsager theorem refers to the fact that energy conservation must occur above a certain criticality threshold, and it can break below a certain criticality threshold for any S bigger than one over three, any weak solution uh, L3 in time equals three energy conserves energy. And for all S less than one over three, there exists. Specifically, weak solutions like that. And a number of comments are in order. The first bullet, sometimes called rigidity, was proven by Constantin E and TT in 1994, building on previous constructions, uh, analysis of Onsager, in fact, and of Greg Eink. Uh, this result was sharpened by Duchamp Robert, basically, who wrote the energy dissipation measure. And the same regularity then was obtained by a little bit Paley approach by Cheskidov, Konstantin, Friedlatter, and Schwitkoi. But the way I view it, this result of these uh, four authors from 2008, it's not the regularity space that's important in that result. That result is important because it shows the locality of the energy flux. It shows you the literal Paley pieces, which are very far away, don't produce too much flux. In fact, there's a kernel which decays. That's the importance of that result. It's not the space that you sometimes see written. It's not this. It's the locality of the energy cascade, which is important in that result. Um, the second bullet, sometimes called flexibility, this is the long story of convex integration constructions and fluids that started with Schaeffer Schmielmann. Then Camilo and Laszlo put this into a very rigorous framework. And then the breakthrough came where when they did the first Nash scheme, the C0 scheme, CL epsilon scheme. That was for me the huge breakthrough. And then it allowed people to build on top of that and build more and more and more of Euler into the construction until I said, <clears throat> finally, did prove the Onsager conjecture, but in fact, you proved the strongest thing. Because <clears throat> there, I said, solutions are colored. C1 third um, minus. They have contact support. They're not dissipative. And actually, this was fixed. Uh, dissipative solutions were constructed immediately after. And Phil's proof was streamlined by Tristan. Uh, uh, 
Camilo Pendaglio. We basically obtain the same result, but with this word dissipative, which just means that the energy is decreasing. And because of weak strong uniqueness that Camilo mentioned a couple of days ago, that's actually quite important. Okay, um, so there's something a bit too strong about this theorem, my perspective. And what's too strong about it is that it shows that Euler is flexible even in this space, which is strictly larger than uh, this space, uh, strictly smaller. <laughs> so, in a sense, the proof is too good. <laughs> It, it, uh, it shows you that Euler is flexible in even a weaker, uh, uh, smaller space. But in light of this previous discussion about turbulence, we really wanted to have a construction which had two features that on the L2 scale, we have more than one over third irregularity which corresponds to the fact that the second order structure function is strictly larger than two or three, the commodore of value. And you may also want to construct solutions which on the L infinity scale, contain no regularity. Meaning that zeta p remains bounded. Uh, Tristan's comment is actually quite important here because I mentioned this number for zeta 2 being 0 0.72. Whereas Sweeney may claim that this is a universal number, I personally believe that it depends a little bit on the experimental setup. So as you can imagine, the solutions we're going to construct are not bound to zeta 2 being 0 0.72. Yes? So did you ask people do more than one? Experiment, absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, more than one domain. Absolutely. These are very serious. <laughs> These are as serious as it gets uh, in the business of numerics. Not some jokers. Um, okay. So that's the motivation, and the first arrow here was actually done earlier in our monograph with Tristan. Uh, not, not there. We have already done the first two. We've already, in our monograph from last year, constructed weak solutions which have basically H1 half regularity. The issue is that in that construction, as I will try to explain, so since there's a, a one sided constraint on the amount of intermittency that you can build in. And as a result of this one sided -sided constraint, the solutions that we constructed here are a bit better than L4, not much better. So they're not, they're not elliptic. Maybe Theo likes that, but I don't. So the fact that you can do both at the same time is the result of that. Okay, that I wrote here. Um, in particular, so if these are experiments, and this is called Logorov, so this is experiments. By the way, <laughs> experiments are all over the place here. This is called Logorov. Our structure functions look like this. Straight line. Straight line. So, in particular, the construction of Phil and then of Tristan, Camilo, and Laszlo does this one. Now we do this one, and experiments lie in the middle. 
which is to suggest that it is very much conceivable that with some effort, one could probably nail any kind of monofractal structure that you want if you work hard enough. I cannot do this, but that would be a great result. This plot seems that there doesn't seem to be an obvious constraint to the method. Yes, to come in. I mean, you you all the line yellow even past two. Uh, yes. Is that, so uh, your solution W11, like, you know, almost W11. So we have not checked it, but I think I'm willing to put a, a nice bottle of whiskey that the answer is yes. <laughs> but you can probably say it directly. That's actually why I'm confident, we, but we have not checked it. Okay. And, and it did, does require non trivial computation. Yeah. But I don't know the definition of intermittency dimension. So <laughs> like small, that's why I don't know. <laughs> so maybe I should do a dotted line. <laughs> 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 but if the construction is monofractal, then it has to be aligned. I, I did not, it's not monofractal. It's, it did. I, or at least that's what I oh, anyway, yeah. monofractal. I think, anyway, okay. Well, has the, then it has to can be. You, can you give us the definition of monofractal and then. <laughs> <laughs> so monofractal means, in my understanding, and Alex can correct me, is that eddy, every eddy splits into two to the capital D eddies at every stage in the cascade. And this capital D is the intermittency dimension. It's a number less than three. So two to the number less than three, many eddies. Okay. That's okay. Uh, but it can be formalized. And Alexei and Roman wrote a paper recently about properly formalizing this. So that's the monofractal. Okay. That you always split into the same number of eddies. And the strength of each eddy has to be the same. But once you start changing the strength, it becomes multi-fractal. Uh, multi so I've got to And I think in your case, the strength kind of changes. Or you can think of the, so the, the critical support and frequency space of the structure. Oh, okay. So if you have that, then I'm... Yeah. Then, okay, then I'm... Okay, so in terms of the proof, or at least some aspects... Ooh, how much time do I have? Did I start at 10? No, 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 okay. Great, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to mention that we borrow pretty heavy machinery from here. And what is the machinery that we borrow? The cutoff functions. And I think the closest analogy that I can think of that these cutoff functions are a joint Eulerian Lagrangian wavelet decomposition. Uh, and that's a real pain to do stuff jointly in Eulerian and Lagrangian, to keep size of frequency in Lagrangian and Eulerian, and to keep track of size of things. It's a pain. What else do we borrow? We borrow local estimates. on the support of these cutoffs for flow maps. We borrow a local modification argument. Because at some point not to lose derivatives, you do need to modify. And we also borrow a local inverse divergence. Operator. And I wrote local in quotations because the principal part of this inverse divergence is local, but there is a non local remainder which is so small that you don't care about. Maybe just to give a flavor, you could I give the definition of one of the cutoff functions? Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe let's just define the velocity cutoff. Okay, that was the joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still. <laughs> well, let's say this is some kind of cutoff. It's adapted to a certain size. And then here you have a sum in M and M of certain sizes, which I'm going to call deltas, certain frequencies, certain time scales. I'm not writing indices. At all. And then you have and many derivatives and many material derivatives of your field. And this N and M run to some incredibly large 
degree, which is related to how close S is to one third. Maybe if you want to smooth, you may want to square that. And then you want to square all of these. And they're designed like that so that when you take a space or a material derivative of this object, it has the correct length scale, the correct time scale in Lagrangian. Okay. That's roughly speaking what they are. It's a bit more complicated. <laughs> and I'm not going to attempt possibly to define the actual ones. I'm told that Matt has in his uh, lectures at the IIS. So I will not attempt to replicate that. I had a few lectures, though. <laughs> <laughs> So the next thing I want to say, this is what we borrow from our previous work. What is new in this work? So the main thing which is new in a sense is that we, we have to be very careful uh, with intermittency. has to be not too cold, not too hot. A phrase I learned from somebody in the audience. Um, we also need to do a bit more careful pipe dodging. In fact, an optimal pipe dodging. And there's some non-trivial estimates Pipe density squared. And these are just some of the changes, but I have underlined the big ones, which are conceptual. And I would say many of the other ones are in technical nature. These were actually uh, just different. Okay, so I will just try to give a brief idea of the proof. The, the proof goes like all Nash schemes. You, you construct iteratively solutions to the euler reynolds system. Then you define a sequence of frequencies, a sequence of amplitudes. And writing the word the sign equal uh, to mean between two universal constants. Uh, the number A is huge. It's the last thing chosen in the scheme. The number B is very close to one. The first thing, in a sense, chosen in the scheme. So these are frequencies and <laughs> amplitudes inverse powers of these frequencies and the beta please think of it as the same as being just a tiny bit than the s okay it's anything less than so beta not s uh, it's the sobolev index it's almost okay so Roughly speaking, what you need to propagate if you want to obtain H one half regularity and at the same time L infinity regularity, well, I wrote that, but it's erased. Um, you need to propagate both L infinity bounds on the stress and L two bounds on the stress. L one bounds. So this is the Q uh, Reynolds stress is propagated this bound and also this bound. One. And again, here by one, I really mean log log of uh, lambda q. Okay. Now, in order to do this, given that the uh, nonlinearity is quadratic, you need to propagate on the velocity increment wq plus one, which is vq plus one, and it's vq. So, this is what you add at the next step of the context duration scheme. 
you need to propagate bounds which correspond to quadratic uh, interactions. So these ones in L2, not L1, less than a half of this. And also, square root of L infinity is L infinity. This one. Okay, so you need to propagate these bounds. Can I ask a question? Yes. So is you really like going in a logarithmic state or no. having like a small model? There's a small okay. Yeah, so there's basically a tiny, tiny, tiny power of lambda, which we use as a fine chopping board because we don't really have little pay constructions, but we're super geometric. And I imagine the closer you get to one half, the closer you have to give up on the exactly, exactly. on the L infinity side, right? Exactly. Okay, so now that you have your goal, uh, this condition is going to ensure. Sorry. This condition is going to ensure because this decays super exponentially that the Reynolds stress will disappear in the limit in L1. And this condition is going to ensure that your final velocity field, V, which is the initial one plus the sum of all increments. Is summable in H one half, and this one is going to ensure that it's summable in any LP less than infinity that you want. And the closer you want P to infinity, the closer you have to take V. Okay, so a little bit about the construction, and I'm going to try to basically convince you of a couple of things. Only I don't think I have any chance to give this proof. Uh, any kind of detailed argument, but I'm going to try to convince me of a, a couple of key points. So, after you've added your increment, of course, you are left with solving this equation the best that you can, at least. This is it's coined as the transport error, the NAS error, and the oscillation error by Camilo and Laszlo. And cancellation of the previous stress occurs here through the mean of this object. So this object, which is the increment, think of it as a finite sum over elements on S2 intersect U3 of some amplitude functions and some pipe flows, which have, which depend on two parameters in a sense, on this frequency and then on another parameter, R sub Q, which measures intermittency. Oh, that's terrible. Intermittency. This object, the amplitude function, it depends on many things. But let's say that it depends only on the stress and on the gradient of the previous velocity. Why does it depend on the stress? Well, because if you want to do a quadratic cancellation of the low frequencies with the stress, your amplitude better behave like, in a sense, square root of the stress. Why does it depend on the gradient of VQ? It's because the whole convex integration scheme has to be done in space-time regions which correspond to super level sets, uh, not super level sets, between two level sets of gradient of VQ. Why? Because you cannot do anything in Lagrangian unless you have Lipschitz vector fields. And you can only do for very short times, which have to do with the inverse uh, Lipschitz scale. And because your vector field is essentially only has, I mean, it's smooth at every step in the iteration, but it only has good bounds in H1 half, 
H1 half does not embed in Lipschitz. So you have to do a chopping, fine chopping argument. And this results in some sets, which are support of cutoff functions. And in that sense, this depends on that. So these, um, this Eulerian Lagrangian wavelet decomposition is built into this. What's also built into this is time cutoffs. So none of these guys live for longer than they should. So let's do the first uh, thing. What is this? This is just a pipe flow, uh, also known as Mikado, but I like to visualize them as pipes. So they're periodic. They go like that, maybe. If this is if psi points in the direction E3. It's very strange to say that the three directions inside of the board, but it is what it is. So these are pipe flows. And you notice two things here. There's a size of the pipe, the diameter. This is lambda q plus one inverse. And that's a periodicity scale. And this is where the intermittency parameter comes in. So this RQ measures both, in a sense, the periodization rate of the pipes, but it also measures the volume of the pipes, because the total volume occupied by these pipes in the torus is basically RQ squared. The square has to do with the fact that there's only thin in two directions. Okay, so this is what these are. And in particular, you can now estimate any norm you want. Let me not put the indices there in LP. So this is uh, lambda q plus one to the n, of course, because the gradient is gonna cost the smallest length scale present. And Notice that you're going to want quadratic cancellations. So you're going to want to normalize these pipes in L2. So if you normalize them in L2 and they have this periodization rate or respectively thinness, then their LP norm is going to scale like that. Okay, so in L2, when P is two, this is one, they're normalized to have unit size in L2. But in L1, they have very small size and in N infinity, they have a huge size. <laughs> so far, nothing that we knew actually. I've seen versions of these objects in uh, previous talks. Okay. So let me now discuss a little bit the Nash area. And by Nash error, I just mean inverse divergence. So what do I want to discuss about it? <laughs> I want to talk about its size in L1 and its size in L2. How about the L1 norm of the Nash error? Well, if you think about it, this is the L1 norm of this. <laughs> and by the way, L1 means L1 in space, C0 in time. I, I forgot to say this, all norms are C0 in time. And what we discovered with Tristan some time ago is that because this object has high frequency and this object has low frequency, they decouple in L1. So you can put a very strange Sobolev inequality, L2, L1, L2. And, and so this, the right size of this, this in L2 is still anti divergence inside Sobolev, right? I'm sorry, inverse div. Thank you very much. Thank you, otherwise the computation will never have worked. The inverse div gains you the large frequency. 
Now, what's the L2 size of this? It's exactly the L1 norm of the stress, the power <laughs> one half. I'm sorry, my throat is. What's the L1 norm of this? Well, we just said it, it's all Q. And what's the L2 norm of this? Well, it's basically lambda Q, delta Q to the one. We want this to be much, much less than delta Q plus Q. Much, much less meaning eating constants. <clears throat> How about the, uh, by the way, notice that this term says, the smaller you make RQ, the better, which is to say, the thinner you make the pipes, the better, not the thinner. They're always size lambda Q plus one, <laughs> periodization rate. They occupy less volume. Okay, let me not write this whole thing again because now the color is inequality is a stupid one and infinity and infinity and infinity. So the lambda q plus one inverse, an infinite norm of rq to the one half. Well, we've said that that's one. An infinity norm of this is rq inverse. And the L infinity norm of the gradient of VQ is to leading order the gradient of WQ, which was the last increment. So that's lambda Q for the gradient. And now for the L infinity norm, I need to put RQ on this one. Because that was the L infinity norm of the previous pipe. Now, this says that the smaller you make R, the worse. Wants you to make R large. The one on the right hand side. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah that one you want. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Matt. Thank you. That's actually very important because this is a you know pretty small number. That's not pretty small. That's it. Okay. That's now not necessarily much smaller than one. It's a bit bigger by a log. Um, Turns out that if you look at these two constraints, you get only one choice. So since beta is really close to one, a b, b being this b, is very close to one, and this beta being very close to one half, these two constraints say that rq better equal this. There's no rule. So this, when we discovered this with Matt, we were, in a sense, not surprised. But you'll see later the part which did surprise us. Okay. So the Nash error tells you you cannot do any kind of different intermittency parameter. Now, as in all convex integrations, Nash schemes, you really need to deal with the transport error. So this is actually in Lagrangian coordinates. So you really have to go to the local, local Lagrangian coordinates of this vector field, compose, do everything that you can, crank machine. And if you are very, very careful and precise, you get the same exact bounds. Exactly the same. Okay, let's go ahead. Now is the part which was a small surprise for us. Because at this point, you're left with the oscillation error, and there's nothing telling you that you should be able to control the oscillation error. So the oscillation error corresponds to inverse div of div of the non-zero mean part of this. Ah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> this and to leading order, it has two pieces div inverse of two terms. One is 
when a pipe interacts with itself, <coughs> the gradient can only land on the amplitude. And this is the non-zero mean. P sub non-zero means function minus its average. This in the paper we call oscillation one. Same in the other. Paper. And this comes from different pipes talking to each other. Um, uh, let me be careful now. And there's another parenthesis. Okay. And this is oscillation two. Now, this term, so bad, you can never make zero. You better make it zero. Now, Phil's proof made it zero by a gluing procedure. And the gluing procedure means that you do one thing in space for every time slice, which we are not doing. Every single time slice, intersects super many cutoffs. It's not homogeneous in space. So we cannot glue. So instead, what we do is we use intermittency. When I'm going to place new pipes, you know, they occupy only this much volume. This is a small number. So there is still room to put other pipes. And this is the thing we want to explore. Basically, there's a volumetric argument, which says that when you add more pipes, if they have the correct quote unquote relative intermittency, meaning one pipe has intermittency RQ1, the other one RQ2, and RQ1 and RQ2 are in a certain balance, then you can do a pigeonhole argument, careful pigeonhole and covering argument, and um, you can place new pipes, but you can only do so on the support of so called checkerboard cutoffs, which are anisotropic. So this is lambda q inverse, and this is lambda q plus one rq inverse. This is different than in the previous paper. We have made checkerboard cutoffs, which have an unusual frequency in them. It's too sharp. This is the frequency of the old stress. So if I put in cutoffs, which have frequencies bigger than both of them, you should normally pay for this. But it turns out you don't pay because there's a cancellation. Um, OK. So on the support of each one of these cutoffs, you look how many pipes are there. They're bent, maybe, because of the Lagrangian coordinates. You project onto this space, and then you check the area, and pigeonhole argument works if exactly the same one half rule. We call this the one half rule. That was our support. But it's exactly the same one half rule, which works if you do this trick. In the previous paper, we had a worse thing because we were making these to be isotropic. Okay, so this is actually zero. And I am way over time, oh, I'm sorry. Um, to deal with this, first have to observe that to leading order, this is really C dot grad because these points in the direction C. So when you take the derivative of this unusually small thing, it points in that direction. And because of that, you don't pay. And that's what saves the day. In addition, and I'll end with this, if you try to bound an infinity norm of this guy, notice this has many frequencies and they're spread somewhere between this and this. And when you invert divergence, you gain that frequency. But when you invert divergence here, you're going to gain much less than here. So what we discovered is actually that the size of this has the opposite thing, namely, the size of this in an infinity is much, much, much less here. And here it's uh, um, RQ squared minus two. Here is much, much less. And this, the fact that this is a, once you write it, it's a trivial estimate, but it seemed non-trivial at the time. 
Once you write this, the, 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 the loss, because you invert the divergence at a small frequency, is compensated by the fact that you're multiplying it with an object of small amplitude. And after that, you have to do exactly like our H1 half paper, go to higher order stresses. You have to count how many higher order stresses you need to do. They're only logarithmically many. And you crank a machine and it works. And I'm sorry I went over Questions? So going back to the uh, structure function, you check that your zeta p is the line for p larger than three, right? So that's not for sure. By interpolation. Basically, if you know, if you know that zeta p double prime is zero at one point, it's zero for all p. So it has to be a horizontal line when you know p goes all the way to zero. It's, it's one of the problems that we proved with the Roman. So, yes. so it's, it has to be a horizontal line all the way. Any other questions? So, so say you take your solution, to, you calculate the, you look at it in the Fourier space, okay, and then you, you do the, like Galerkin cutoff or something like that. Okay. So they, then you get uh, some right hand side, right? And the what what the right hand side will look like? It's exactly what the Reynolds stress equals. So let's say you Galerkin truncate at lambda q and mm -hmm. one of these lambda qs. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at that level, the right hand side is exactly equal to the divergence of the renal stress. So you know exactly what the right hand side is. It's a function. By the way, in frequency space, this, uh, this object, something like this is modulus of the frequency, and this is the amplitude of W hat. <coughs> something like this it's sampled from this distribution at the periodization rate which corresponds to this periodization rate and this is q plus one. That's so will these pipes leave some trace in the coefficients they do have a gaussian trace learning. so but the, the trace they leave is Gaussian. You can't make them compact support. You would pay somewhere else and we don't want to pay there in physical space, but they make a Gaussian. Any more questions? Vlad, uh, uh, can you make this smooth <laughs> outside a set uh, of a set? Uh, in, in time, Maria, or in space time? Space time outside the uh, a set that you throw away, a closed set. We have, it zero. <laughs> we have not checked exactly the dimension of such a set, the Hausdorff dimension, which is probably what you're after. Yes. Uh, so it's not two. I mean, can you go close to two? I, Matt and I currently believe, although we do not have a proof, that the set of singularities is supported on a house two-dimensional Hausdorff measure set. Okay. And uh, closed, clearly. Uniformly in time, right? Exactly. Um, also, the, the set is different in time. It's different at every time slice, but it's measured the same. Okay. okay. Not measured, I mentioned, I'm sorry. I yes. But we, we have not written that in the papers. It's just the computation we did. Okay. And maybe I, I didn't get it probably, but can you explain better where you get two? Which two? These two of the dimension. It's from this one half rule. Ah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> you know, when Srini measures things, he looks at longitudinal structure functions and orthogonal ones, and there's actually a discrepancy. And he actually writes in the paper that the discrepancy is consistent with sheets emerging, which have two dimensions. And while our construction is in a very vague sense consisting of many fractal sheets, 
we don't really have like a nice, beautiful sheet uh, anywhere. But it's really, morally speaking, the same. It's like a fractal made out of local sheets. But it also comes directly from the portion of space that these pipes fill, or, or alternatively, if you look in frequency space, the sort of por portions. But it's also the periodization rate, right? Which yeah, yeah. Is, which is the. Um, I have a question, Vlad. Uh, yeah. So when you said that you would expect uh, any monofractal behavior between like Kolmogorov and your your theorem, what would you exactly mean? So what would be your guess? What is true? I meant that in a pretty vague sense, I imagine that if you draw any line in between the Kolmogorov line and this line, maybe if you work hard, you can construct a solution which has uh, zeta p's along that line. Maybe any concave curve. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So if there's no more questions, thank the speaker. Oh, 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 there is. There is. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, I was a bit late, probably. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, re related to the question of Maria, when you say singularities are concentrated on these two dimensional set, in some sense, what do you mean by singular? Like outside of the singular, like what is the definition of singularity? Uh, where the pipe goes on top of a pipe, goes on top of a pipe, goes on top of a pipe. <laughs> okay, so, a so a physical definition. Or, I mean, can you say something about the regularity of the solution outside? Ah, that's what you're asking. I don't know. Luigi, to be honest, I do not know if we can compute. Uh, I mean, very far from the set of curvature C infinity. But uh, you probably want to know if what's the regularity as a function of the distance to the set. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Well, but you, you should have a way to estimate it, no? I mean, Yes, Maria, but there's only so much time. <laughs> I'm pretty young. <laughs> uh, that, no, <laughs> good thanks for speaking. <laughs>